um, where, by the way, I was assured that rent control housing would be protected um, in the form of permanent affordability. But that's not my question. It's about timelines. At that open house, and I wish I'd taken a picture, but I'm pretty sure there was a storyboard there that said it's expected that the mayor will sign this legislation very early in 2016, number one. And number two, Katie, specifically to you, what you wrote is you say you're going to do outreach to the 11 districts, as in the 11 supervisors. Is there an assurance to everybody here that there will be meetings in every single supervisorial district open to the public in venues larger than this so that everybody can fit in? Is there a commitment from the mayor's office and from a co-sponsor for legislation? Yeah. 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 So we, I'm actually been making my way through each of the supervisors. I've gotten to two of my colleagues so far. I would never move forward with legislation without talking to all of them, and I've asked each of them to provide us with information about what community groups or meetings that either the planning department, mayor's office, we can all go to. So that is something that we're already working on, and we do not want to move forward with the legislation without doing that, okay? Um, I know that there was a slide that was put on the planning department's website earlier, because earlier they were under the impression they were gonna try to have this pass and signed by the end of the year. We have pushed back because of a lot of the concerns we've heard. It is not happening by the end of this year. 2016 is the earliest. Two the months from now. The end of the year. I, that's why it's not happening. So that's why it's not happening. So thank you, residents, for, for really speaking out because that the timeline is much further away than you. We're not, yes, exactly. We're not moving forward with it at the end of this year, okay? Okay, next. Okay. Um, <laughs> Is I'm there an assurance from the mayor's office? That we'll have meetings in each In each supervisorial district. Venues. In a venue large enough to accommodate groups like this. Yes. Yes, thank you. Good. <laughs> was that a simple enough answer for us? Yes. <laughs> and trust me, the other supervisors we'll hear about tonight. <laughs> and we'll have a larger venue. <laughs> I think a lot of people who love this neighborhood take some comfort in the fact that most of this doesn't seem to be subject because there are one or ours too. My question is to the planning department or to Supervisor Tango, what are what are the protections against the city just changing the zoning mm -hmm. and making it all RH3 exactly. and then the, the whole program? Yeah. Any any zoning changes would have to be legislative. I would be pretty stupid to try to legislate changes to the zoning, okay? So that is not going to happen under my watch. I just want to add that almost every housing legislation I've ever seen come through the city in the past 10 years has said except RH1 and RH2. I think it's pretty clear that the city values its single-family housing stock. Okay. So please don't underestimate the impact on us living here, transportation, and transit. During peak hours, it's standing room only by, uh, by 19th Avenue on the N Express and the N Judah. How can we possibly start adding people? I, I believe in affordability. I think that's great. But this neighborhood right now cannot support that. Traffic is, is congested. Car traffic is congested by 25th Avenue in Lincoln. It takes me an hour to get downtown whether I'm on the N Judah or driving. It's ridiculous. That has got to be dealt with. So I would, I would just first of all say that nobody is taking that question for granted. We understand it's a major concern, not only of you, but of other residents. And so, for one, we're not taking that for granted. I think the second, if you look at the study area and you look at where the, the impact will be of this program, it is geographically spread out through a lot of the city. It's in places beyond the sunset. And so it's it's um, fairly equitable in terms of the way that it's distributed. We can show you, go back to the map and show it to you. Well, so, but what I see is high density during the, at, at the transit corridor with no extra Anjudas or, or El Terrabel or, or well, any other, the 29 Sunset. You, you point out, a, this is a very, it's a good point. And so one of the things that we're gonna be looking at is the addition of additional infrastructure uh, particularly transportation. So the, that that, that look needs to happen before this is implemented. Of, of course, I agree. And we are looking right now. I mean, we are, we are doing this lighting, yes. We are ready to do uh, You say these units will uh, be affordable. Like, will it be deeply affordable, like for <laughs> teachers or working class people? Yeah. And another thing is, like, how can we factor this? How can, is there a way that we could factor in, say, like, you know, uh, Dealing with this, dealing with like you know homeless issues because there's like a lack of space uh, for uh, 
housing and it's a big issue in the city and I figure like you know affordable housing could also include not low income housing. Yes. So what is affordable? Let's start with that. So within this program, this program is, is aimed at hitting different income targets, particularly those that are currently not served by the market or served by our affordable housing program. Just just so people understand, we have in our affordable housing um, that is uh, built um, and, and subsidized by the city. These, these sites um, require a, a certain number of those units to be set aside for homeless individuals, homeless families, sometimes tr uh, transitional age youth, or other populations that are vulnerable. Um, the reason behind that is, is because it is, it is uh, more cost effective and more humane to house people who are homeless than it is to allow them to be on the street. I do want to say, for this program, this program is not designed to serve that population. I just want to be really clear for folks. Um, where it is designed to serve is uh, bringing units of, you know, 55% of area median income, which is roughly about, for a family of four, of $55,000 of combined household income, uh, up to 140% of area median income, which is roughly, for a family of four, about $140,000. I can tell you, folks, I, I don't know how many of you live within that that income range, but there are very few options available for people in that area. And these are yep. teachers, these are uh, some of our paraprofessionals, uh, these are uh, construction workers who build the housing. So I just want to point out, these are folks who are not served. And from the city side, we have to do everything possible in a crisis to serve as many people as possible. And that's, this, this, this project helps to serve that population. Frank, you've had your hand up for a while. Yes. We'll get to some others. Thank you. I, I'm a San Francisco resident. I live in the Sunset. Uh, my daughter and her two children um, live with us because they can't afford housing in San Francisco. I'm really glad you're doing this. You're looking into this. You know, my daughter works in San Francisco public schools. It seems to me that uh, creating affordable housing like this is useful. So, so, so one of my questions is, how many sites here are in the sunset approximately. We talked about um, you know, 240 or so citywide. How many are in this district? I'm concerned too because I kind of, I'm not going to say I'm exactly low income, but I'm very scared because I live in an apartment complex in 40th and Ortega for 40 years, and I'm paying real cheap rent, and I'm really scared. If this happens, what's going to happen to me? Because, and then I was at for Section 8, and I'm afraid to take Section 8 because the owner will do the market rate, and he'll and I'll never get that cheap rent again. And I waited 20 years, so I'm, and I have to let go of something that I waited for 20 years. Go because for building and, vulnerable. and I'm concerned about the low income people in the sunset. I don't want to tell you my rent is kind of like almost 800, 700. Okay. So I'm one of the lucky few, but I'm scared. So, ma'am, um, this is a very <laughs> specific question to you. I'm happy to talk with you afterwards. We can kind of dive into a little bit of the details and yeah. tell you a little bit more. And I'm fourth generation. I feel my grandmother was a pillar of this community. She was a teacher at St. Gabriel's. So it's kind of it scary. Like also, we're going to check, but I'm not sure your areas in the program. So we'll, we'll confirm with you after the meeting. Yeah, hi. Um, so. What about property owners? I, too, am fourth generation, and I work for City College, and I haven't had a raise since 2007. In fact, I've had a pay cut. Okay, Even the so, yeah. all right. So, I own my house, I've paid tax, and I've lived here all my life, but I'm living, I live on 45th and Judah. I've heard the tri one of the four doors possibly is the 7-Eleven there. If a building goes up there, I lose my light, I lose my view, I lose my garden, and if I ever should want to move, I lose my parking, and if I should ever want to move, move I'm sure my property value will go down because who wants to look at another building right across? So what is the compensation for those of us who are really going to have our homes ruined? Like we said, we're not changing, but there's the opportunity to build in further community input processes uh, when there's a proposal uh, put forth to the planning department. If someone submits an applicant, well, first, if someone buys a building, if someone or someone decides to sell their building and want to engage in this development work, we're really interested in not only the current existing process, but what are some other ways that we can get neighbors who live in the immediate vicinity to actually weigh in and you know, participate in the, the process, right, that exists uh, if there's a project being proposed 
right in your immediate area. So that is something that we're, again, we're looking Expand at. The notification area. I'm sorry? Expand the notification area if you want more involvement. Well, I mean, in this instance, it sounds like it's the balancing the need to, you know, the, the right for that, for that person to be able to develop that site with the relationship that it has with the surrounding people. And I think when you're doing development, you're thinking about it, we have to be very careful about that and make sure it's not antagonistic. To make sure that there's input and make sure that we can think through the, um, the impact that that's going to have on residents. So it's something we certainly are thinking about. Here. Okay. Uh, two, two, two okay. quick things. One is this growth is regional. It is not just San Francisco. And I, I don't think most of the residents of the city or the Sunset want to be the leaders in creating the new housing. Uh, so that's more that's more of a comment. The but the the other thing is that why are we not funding the planning people adequately to deal with the requests that they're getting. Okay, you know, the, th the thing is we've spent 50, 80 years creating a zoning system and a planning system and now we're not funding. Okay, you know, th that would seem to be the first measure that this may be necessary. I'm not convinced it is yet, but so folks I, I want to be really clear the sunset is there is a lot of other places within the city that development has been going on with for a while now uh, for the next 10 years. We basically and Tim Cole and, and and Peter can chime in probably with opposing viewpoints on this but I think there is about 12 percent of the city's land mass in which we were developing on um, so that is I just want to be really clear and you are right to point out this is a regional issue it's a peninsula issue, it's a uh, East Bay issue, and it's a North Bay issue. And I think um, we need to encourage the other cities and figure out ways for, for the growth that is occurring in the area to be spread out equitably, um, in particular for the peninsula to, to take their share of uh, development. I think that's very important. It's certainly something the mayor brings up every time he meets with one of the, uh, you know, the small city mayors. He's like, hey, you know, we need your help. Uh, but the second question is, is that we do development and every permit in the city is discretionary. So when that happens, everything has to be a discussion. And I, I, I hope you find that this program is done that way, and I hope you hold us accountable to ensure that it is done that way. Okay, gentlemen in the orange or gold shirt. Okay, thank you. Um, you know, uh, we're being told that the reason we cannot pull the, the plug on this and come back and talk with our district before legislation goes in is because of a compliance issue. Are we any more out of compliance now than we were when lobbyists and uh, different uh, groups and uh, the, when they were meeting for 18 months were we out of compliance then in the exact same way we are now and can we have put online the records of the meeting of those groups those work groups that met for 18 months while we were never consulted one minute yeah. before this legislation Tell me about okay Process, okay, so um, people did not meet for 18 months. What happened was, he said you did. well, I, I, I don't know who he is, on but your, on your website, so, never mind. Okay. For so I, I want to be really clear because I was involved from the from the conception to to the point we are right now, is that there was a short period of time where we asked housing experts, people well, who have knowledge of housing issues. Let, let me let me let me answer. We asked housing experts, housing geeks, housing nerds to come together and help us to figure this stuff out. Super technical. I'll be honest with you, sir, if you're not a, a super housing nerd, it's not that interesting. I hear you. But I love it. There you go, I'm gonna sign him up. He's gonna work in the planning department. But what, what, what they did was to work out some of the technical components. And then what happened after that, and why the length of that 18 month time period was where Kirsten and her staff, along with some of the consultants, worked through some of the modeling, worked out some of the kinks to figure it out so that we could then come to you and have the discussion about what the program is. 
I, we don't we don't ask you to be technical experts, right? Um, that's what we do is we want to come to you with a program that at least has some form to it. So then you can tell us how you would like to shape it. Are we any more out of this gentleman no, with the paper. Paper. Sorry, you had another question about. Um, I can answer the compliance, but also yes. you had a question about the documents that are available online. And I just want you to know all of the studies that we completed, all of the technical analysis, both of the physical form, what these buildings might look like, which was completed by David Baker Architecture, and also the financial modeling. But to Peter's question of are we making a good deal, are we capturing the value we're adding in the form of affordable housing? Those studies are available online, as well as m much more of the analytical work that went on the policy side to inform this program. In terms about compliance, yeah, he also asked about compliance. In terms of compliance, we've been out of compliance since 2013. We have a number of preliminary project assessments for the, since we're all housing nerds, for the housing nerds, that's the first thing you submit to the planning department that says, I have this idea, please give me initial feedback. Many of those projects include reference to the state density bonus law and their expectation to, to make use of it. So the question is, do they make use of it through this program, which caps the way they use it, or do they make use of it through as mediated through the state law, which has sort of a very broad brush approach to setting guidelines? This gentleman back here holding the paper up. Oh, sorry. Can you talk loud? Sure. I'm Murphy. Uh, I also live out here, a resident, and I also work for this, uh, with the city government assistance. I'm a case manager and a counselor with people who are also unemployed or low income. And I'm just, I have a real question after hearing a few things. Um, can you at least change the name from affordable? Because after hearing what you guys said, <laughs> yeah, it is not affordable. It's made for a certain group of people, but not this low-income people. Then it's not affordable. That's that's a smack in the face. That's very disrespectful for people who thirty thousand dollars have to live affordable, but it's not within reach. Can you at least change the name so that it is not so insultive or? Painful. It just it, the AMI tablet works. It's easier to in a, in a group like this mm -hmm. to it's explain the AMI levels based on a family a of four. It's a word to get people to vote for something that doesn't benefit them. Mm -hmm. if, it's going to be, if it's not going to be for everybody, change the name. Just say it's for not for you. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, so sir, <laughs> sir, you bring up a good point. And, and I, if you if you would allow me the opportunity to to respond back. So we have, we basically spend the overwhelming bulk of the money that we have to develop affordable housing for low-income residents. Overwhelmingly, 98% of what we do goes for that population. So what I'm, I'm just telling you, sir, like there are, this is a problem, you can critique it as you will, and I hear you, but this is a program designed to serve a certain population. We have... A, a robust pipeline of projects that are designed to serve uh, very low-income individuals. And I'm happy to talk to you more about it afterwards. Well, I'm, I'm going to wait. If you say a family of four and was it 50, 55000 dollars? If you have two working adults in a household, fifty-five thousand dollars is not that high. And that I, th if that's the the starting point, I think we have to drill down into. A two-family household or single households, they don't have that information tonight. I hear what you're saying. It's right up there. It, it's just harder in a forum like this to start rattling off AMI levels. And, but this is a good, this tells you in the back, you know, who would, who would benefit from the program as it's currently constructed. Okay. This gentleman had a question. Hi, um, my name is Bob. I have a question, but I get flustered. Um, uh, how are you going to meet the uh, requirements set forth and approved by the city um, Proposition K last year if this program fails? Like, I, I hear all the concerns people are raising, but people did also overwhelmingly vote for Prop K, so I'm curious, like, what's your backup to this? Like, what else are you considering if this doesn't work out? 
I would, I would just say really quickly that this is one of several tools. This is not the only thing we're trying to do. It's not just because we're trying to build, build, build that this legislation is before us. It's actually, number one, because of compliance, trying to serve another population, which is the middle income that we have not been providing services for at all in the city. Uh, but again, it's one of several out of the toolkits. Um, it's a long range plan. It's not that we're going to see thousands of units happen overnight, but I, I do want to turn it over to the mayor's office because that, that is what actually Jeff's focus is on. It's on housing in San Francisco and how we're going to achieve it. We're going to take one more question. This lady in the back has her hand up. Real quick answer, Sorry, Linda. You didn't get yours asked. So this is the centerpiece of our middle income program. If we don't move forward with this at the current level, then there is very few backups we have. Very few, particularly those that provide the kind of units that this can provide. So from, from the mayor's office standpoint, it's a very important program, which is why we're here to talk with you. One more question, and we'll keep it short. I, I want to tell you that what you should read here, it's not only about the residents that are on the playa, it's about the whole city, and it's about our coastline and beautiful place that we have, what people live in San Francisco. And so this should be brought up at every single um, discussion around the city, that, we, that up to seven stories can line our beach down there, just like those buildings down there. Exactly, and, um, thank you. Hopefully not that big, but it's going up and it's closing that whole area off. Um, and the other one is I'm interested in the priorities for the low, uh, for the below market rate housing or the affordable housing. Are we going to be attracting middle income people to come to our city? Is it going to people that have lived here? And um, what's the priorities for who gets these apartments? That are sort of affordable. That's a great question. So I, we are losing middle income households at a greater rate than any other sort of income band. And so we are hoping it will service existing residents. The Board of Supervisors and the Planning Commission are working on legislation, uh, Mayor's Office of Housing rather, to offer prioritization for the BMR units to people who are within the neighborhood that it is being built. So if a unit were to come along in the Richmond district that was below market rate, maybe in one of these middle income units, there, I think it's 20% of the, pri the spaces would be prioritized for people in the neighborhood. There's a number of other ways that people receive prioritization depending on their income level, including being displaced by uh, demolition, eviction, or several other pieces. So yes, that's the intent. I am very sorry, we are out of time. We're actually a half hour over what the library gave us. I want to thank uh, Kirsten Here. and Jeff. Yeah.